Hello, Chemistry 11. This is Mr. Chan. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to go over a little bit of the readings that I signed last day. Uh, this was number one, where you had to read pages 134 to 137 and answering the questions. Now, when you first took a look at the reading, majority of the stuff you probably said you learned back in grade 10. But there are a few that I want to highlight um, in this reading that is a, a buildup of what you learned in grade 10. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a look at the readings, okay? So when you did the readings, most of you probably remembered, hey, we have synthesis, we have decomposition, and hopefully you remember things from grade your grade 10 teacher about the characteristics of, you know, what synthesis was, what decomposition is, okay? So most of it should have been pretty straightforward. The one that I wanna focus on is, I wanna focus on single replacement. Now, back in grade 10, you learned that single replacement, what you had was, it said, one element is replaced by another in the compound, okay? And when you take a look at the example here, you see that chlorine replaces the bromine. In the other example, you see that iron replaced the copper. One thing that you need to remember for single replacement is that the non-metal replaces a non-metal, a metal replaces the metal. So in the example with chlorine and potassium bromide, because chlorine is a non-metal, it replaces the non-metal in potassium bromide. And this is how you get potassium chloride and chlorine gas or bromine gas as a product. In the second example, what happened was iron, which is a metal, replaces the copper in copper two sulfate because copper in copper two sulfate is the metal. So in this case, this is the metal that gets replaced. And this is the metal. Now, that you learned back in grade 10. Not a big deal. But if you read on, one thing that I would like you to highlight is the fact here. It says, in this case, not all replacement reactions for which equations can be written will actually occur. The element in that is doing the replacing must be be able to displace the element occurring in the compound, okay? Now, and this ability is called the activity of the element, okay? Now, so let's say for example here, we have two examples that they give you. Notice nickel is a metal should be replacing magnesium. Okay, but notice it says here, it is no reaction. The question is, why? So what you need to do is you need, for single replacement reactions, what you do is we look at this activity series. Now, the activity series, again, is sort of ranks the different elements in terms of their activity. So in this particular case, if we were to compare nickel and magnesium, nickel is right here, magnesium is right here. Magnesium, since it is higher up on the activity series, is more active than nickel. And since it is more active than nickel, therefore, will form the compound. Nickel was not able, is not as active as magnesium, and so is not able to replace the magnesium to form the compound, all right? Now, in this case, notice here, let's do another example with magnesium. So here we have magnesium as a free element, and now we have aluminum as the compound. 
So again, looking at the table here, if we compare magnesium versus aluminum, notice why does the reaction work is because magnesium is the more active one will form the compound. Now, in this case, I have just focused on metals replacing metals, like nickel and magnesium or magnesium and aluminum. But you should also be aware of the fact that you can compare the non-metals, okay, in the single replacement reactions. Now, I will be giving you this table on your test, okay? You just need to know how to um, interpret it. The next thing is, if you click on the link below, there is a, a video that shows you the different metals and how some will react with hydrochloric acid and some will not. And again, that is based upon the activity of the element and versus hydrochloric acid, which is a source of hydrogen. So again, that will be in the link below. Now, the next one that I would like you to be aware of is double replacement. Now, again, back in grade 10, the double replacement is basically where it says you switch partners. So elements in the solution exchange places or replace each other, okay? Now, most of you are pretty comfortable with that from grade 10. So in this case, let's say we have zinc and bromine. So we have zinc, I will highlight in yellow, bromide will be in blue. And what happens is you have silver and you have nitrate. Now, again, what happens is they switch partners. So you have zinc that goes with the nitrate. Let's see. While you have silver with bromine. Now, where's bromine? Bromine's in blue. Now, the key thing I want you to, fig to notice is this. Notice the phase symbols. We have an S and we have an AQ. Now, further along, you will notice that in this case, in another deep double replacement reaction, FeCO3 has the phase symbol S, K2SO4 has the phase symbol AQ. PB has the S and KNO3 has the AQ. Now, how do we know which one will get the phase symbol of S and which one is the phase symbol of AQ? Now, before we do that, please remember, what does S and AQ mean? S means that it is a solid, okay? AQ means that the substance dissolves in water, okay? So going back to this particular question, oopsie, let's see, where's the reading? So in a double replacement reaction, how do you know which one forms a solid and which one dissolves in solution? Now, what do I mean by solid? So let's say you have a picture here. Notice you have two solutions. And when you mix them together, one of them, you form this yellow solid which we call a precipitate. So how do we figure this out? And the thing that you want to use is you want to use something called the solubility table. Now in your readings, this is known as appendix D. But what you can do is you can say, you say use the solubility table. Now, what do I mean by this? In the back of your periodic table, you will see this solubility table. So this is a table that sort of helps us figure out which ones when dissolved in water will be soluble or will stay a solid. 
So notice down the right-hand side, a few things that you should notice. Number one, soluble. What that means is that it dissolves in water. In water, so what happens is the phase symbol of A2. Okay, I'll just put a bracket around here. Now, if you look on your table down below a little bit further, you will see the word that says low solubility. What that means is stays as solid. in water. Use, so it will be the face symbol of S. Okay, so that's one thing. So how do you read this table and how do you use it? Well, there are two columns. One column is the negative ions. The second column is the positive ions. Now, another name for negative ions is anions. And another name for positive ions is cations. Now, the other thing you should notice is this term alkali ions. This represents all the elements in the first column of the periodic table. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium. But instead of individually listing them, we just use the general term of alkali ions. Just like in my chemistry classes, instead of naming each student individually, I just say, hello, chemistry 11, and that covers everybody. So how do we use this table and be able to figure out, oopsie, why in this case, let's use, oh, this example. Why is PBI2 a solid and KNO3 aqueous? All right, so what you first have to do is go back to chem chemical naming. So if we had KNO3, you know that KNO3 is made up of K plus and NO3 minus one. Okay, so the first thing we do is we look for the negative ion. In this case, NO3. So if we look for the NO3, ah, here it is. Now, what did NO3 combine with? It combined with K. Okay. Right here. And what happened here is if we look across, this tells us that KNO3 is soluble. It will dissolve in water. And so this is why, if you look at KNO3 in your reading, this is why you notice there was AQ as the phase symbol. Okay. Now, why was PBI2 a solid? Again, using the solubility table, <coughs> again, first of all, what you have to think of is, oh, okay, what ions make up PBI2? It will be PBI2 is made up of PB plus two and I minus one. Again, going back to chemical naming. So you look for I minus one, which is right here. And if I can make this a little smaller, you notice that you have PB right here. 
that combination, you look across and it says low solubility. So what that means is, is when PBI2 is formed, what happens is that it stays as a solid. It doesn't dissolve like KNO3. So this is why we have the phase symbol of solid. So if we get back here. Okay. Oopsie. That's why you have a solid here for PBI2. Okay. So those are just a couple of key things I would like you to be aware of when you were doing your readings that um, was goes above and beyond what you had learned back in grade 10. All right, folks. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.